Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, April the 2nd, 2022. It is currently 1015 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Abilene, Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in. I know you have million of other th- uh, I know you have million uh, a million options, million a million other things you can listen to. Yeah, probably you want to go listen to them because they could probably say a million other options better than I can obviously say it this morning. But yes, you have a million other options, so we are grateful and thankful that you take any time to listen to what we are trying to do here, but hopefully you will find this uh, discussion to be very beneficial and very helpful. Here's how it started. I woke up this morning looking at different news articles, just just trying to see what was going on in the world, and I came across the following headline. The cure for spiritual cancer is simple but not easy. The cure for spiritual cancer is simple but but not easy. And as soon as I saw the headline, I didn't even read the article. I just stopped. And I started thinking of this idea, this concept of a spiritual cancer. What is a spiritual cancer? Well, obviously, whatever this article is going to say, they're utilizing the concept of physical cancer as some kind of analogy, as an illustration of something being wrong with us spiritually. But they use the concept of cancer. Now, are they using the concept of cancer just because cancer is an absolutely horrible and horrific thing that kills and destroys so many lives and so many people? Is it simply they're just taking something that is a horrible disease and then making and using it as an analogy of a spiritual disease that is destructive and hurts so many people. Is that, or is there something specific about cancer is the reason they, they used it? So I thought, well, what is the definition of cancer? What is cancer? Well, cancer is a disease in which some of the body's cells grow uncontrollably and spread to other parts of the body. Cancer can start almost anywhere in the human body, which is made up of trillion of cells. Normally, human cells grow and multiply through a process called cell division to form new cells the body, uh, as the body needs them. Okay, well, let me read this again. Normally, human cells grow and multiply through a process called cell division to form new cells as the body needs them. When cells grow older or become damaged, they die and new cells take their place. Sometimes this orderly process breaks down and abnormal or damaged cells grow and multiply when they shouldn't. These cells may form tumors, which are lumps of tissue. Tumors can be cancerous or not cancerous. Cancerous tumors spread into or invade nearby tissues and can travel to distant places in the body to form new tumors. Cancerous tumors, and and then they go on to add more information about it. But please note what happens. This is very important. All right. Okay. So what you have is abnormal or damaged cells within the body begin, they multiply and grow when they shouldn't. These cells may form tumors, which are lumps of tissue. Tumors can be cancerous or not cancerous. These cancerous tumors spread into or invade nearby issue or near nearby tissues. All right. So this is very important. It starts within the body, within the body, and something goes wrong, and you have this this growth of abnormal or damaged cells. They begin to grow, they begin to spread throughout the body. They form tumors which spread or invade nearby tissues and travel to distant places of the body. Everything is happening within the body. You have cancer that it de- develops and spreads within the body. So when we think of a spiritual cancer, we're thinking of something that happens within the body. Are we talking a spiritual cancer within the body of Christ? Are we talking about a spiritual cancer that could develop within my own spiritual life? 
but it's when something abnormal, something, as they say, something damaged, there's something abnormal, there's something damaged, it's in the body, and then it begins to spread, and it begins to spread, and then these tumors begin to spread to different parts of the body. So a spiritual cancer is something inside the body that is abnormal or damaged that begins to spread. Now, do do you think that that's a a good illustration? Do you think that's a great illustration of of things that happen within the body of Christ and that which happens within the church and that which which happens within your own spiritual life? I think there I think we could really work on that illustration, that allegory, and really maybe flesh it out a little more. But I wanted to at least I wanted to start there because this headline talks about spiritual cancer. And I and I you know, when I read the headline, I didn't know which way they were going. Just you know, pick a horrible disease and just refer to the disease a, a spiritual disease as cancer, or are they using it specifically because how cancer forms because how cancer spreads because how cancer grows i i think i think it could go different directions but let's go back to the original art, article and you you we, well let's just see which direction they go all right so here's the headline again the cure for spiritual cancer is simple but not easy the article begins this way and it was published on uh november the 30th 2021 all right Here is uh, how it begins. This is the first paragraph. I recently read an intriguing excerpt from a book. Paraphrasing, it says, A very prosperous and divided nation is about to implode. Many hold to a form of godliness, but deny the true God. As drunkenness and addiction spiral out of control, Sexual sin and perversion have captivated the minds of millions. Marriages are crumbling, families deteriorating, and children are suffering. There is little hope for justice when oppression and abuse run rampant. The cry goes out, is there any hope? Now, let's stop right here. The focus, at least in this opening paragraph, appears to be speaking of the nation, that there is a spiritual cancer within the nation. Now, see, when you go that direction, then I don't, does the analogy hold up, right? Because the nation, the nation, the country, the United States of America, has it ever truly been spiritual and godly? It's always had, you could say, a form of godliness, but it's different. Let me state it this way. And I think this is a very important distinction. There is a big distinction between morality and salvation. Someone can have a, a form of outward morality that does not necessarily in any way, shape, or form demonstrate or prove true salvation or regeneration or true faith in Christ or even a true biblical worldview. Someone can be very moral, very conservative in so many issues that doesn't have any necessarily true connection with a biblical understanding, a biblical worldview. I think sometimes we we just say, well, there was a time people were more moral, so that had to be a more spiritual time. They're pointing to all of the, the things wrong in the culture today. So if but if you if you diagnose the culture today as having some kind of a spiritual cancer then you ha- then you're implying that that if we go with a cancer analogy that there was a time that well everyone was really spiritual and then within the the spiritual body I guess the nation a cancer formed and began to spread I I think that's a wrong understanding I I think that there's always been I think within America, within all kinds of countries, there, there's a sense of morality. Maybe within America, that morality was connected and associated with Christianity. But that did not necessarily mean in any way, shape, or form that it was biblical Christianity. It, you could argue it was b- biblical morality, but it was not necessarily always biblical Christianity. L- let's see where they go here. Although it fits the bill, this is not a description of America. It's a description of spiritual cancer in Israel in 700 BC. And yes, there is hope. 
God in his mercy gave a remedy that is timeless, a healing balm for spiritual cancer. We must, we must simply listen and obey these same principles. So even they, they, they refer to a nation, but they were referring to Israel. Okay, so Israel is a nation called by God. All right, they had all these wonderful spiritual blessings. Yes, they had God's law. They had God's presence there. They had they had priests. They had prophets. They had they had so much with them. They had covenants. They had promises. They had, they had so much going for them. But within that body, a cancer began to form. A a a, a cancer began to spread, and it began to infect the nation over and over and over and over again. All right. Let, let let's see where they go here. The next thing they have here is diagnose the disease. Like physical cancer, okay, so now they're now they're now they're going to bring in this correlation with with physical cancer. Like physical like physical cancer, spiritual cancer spreads and affects all areas from the family to the government and the schools. And like a doctor, we must too properly diagnose the disease. Now, it seems the focus here goes back to, like, it, it goes beyond just the body of Christ. It goes to the nation. And the, I guess this is where I struggle a little bit. This is where I I kind of, I kind of uh, call, I call a little of this a little bit into question because I guess from my, and I know my perspective is not always popular um, because I, I very much, I very much do not like and I very much reject any kind of nationalistic Christianity, Christian nationalism of any of any way, shape, or form. I get very, 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 very nervous because I think if you look at 2,000 years of church history, one, this is just a fact, whenever church and state merge, people begin to die. It always goes horribly wrong. But I just think that, that anytime you look to the nation, to a nation, and you try to say, somehow say, we can fix the nation. We can we can make the nation godly. We can make the nation moral. We that that approach to me is not a biblical approach. Let, let me let me try to explain. If if I go if I go to say to the to the Great Commission, the Great Commission is for me to go teach. We believe that's evangelism. That's going and evangelizing individuals, as they believe the word, baptize, that's the second part of the Great Commission, then baptize, then teach them to obey. The first part is evangelism, demonstrating that there is a God, that they are a sinner, that they stand condemned by that holy God, and preaching the, the hope and the, and, and the truth of the gospel, that their salvation is based on what Christ did for them, that they are to believe and trust in Christ alone. Then they are baptized, brought into the church. Then they are taught to obey. The obedience, being taught obedience, comes after salvation, comes after regeneration. And at different times within the evangelical Christian world, they look. we look at the nation and we're like, the nation is messed up. The nation is wrong. And so it's always about, we're going to reclaim America. We're going to, we're going to fix America. We're going to save America. So you have things that form going back to the 70s, the moral majority. And you always have these organizations that somehow going to fight and try to get America back on the right track. And it usually, it goes something like this. We're going to use uh, the political office, we're going to get politicians in power, and we're going to pass bills, and we're going to pass to to make you know to bring America back to some kind of spiritual understanding or some type of morality. We're going to pass laws, and we're going to go after this, and we're going to ban this, and we're going to stop this, or it will go with boycotts and we, we, American Family Association. They just sent out a an an email alert. What? three days ago, five days ago, that we need to boycott Disney. So it's boycotting, but it's all an attempt to, we're going to make the country live according to biblical morality. And I think that that is just spiritually, theologically, just completely uh, goes against the Bible. No, the Bible is preached the gospel. Once someone is saved, you then teach them to obey. 
Many Christians want to teach an, a morality and try to get everyone in America to live according to that morality without regeneration. You can't, that, that, that is having everything backwards. You can't fix spiritual cancer. This is very important. You can't fix spiritual cancer without conversion. Spiritual cancer cannot be fixed by simply trying to get everyone to live a moral life. I think many Christians want morality more than they want salvation. They want morality more than they want conversion because the immorality of the world makes them feel uncomfortable or they don't like it or it bothers them or it's not like it was when they grew up. In some cases, it's more like a an age thing. Well, I want the country to be like it was when I grew up. And it's like... It's it's not about just making you feel comfortable. What should be our concern is the lack of salvation. So I get a little nervous here. Let me read that again. Like physical cancer, spiritual cancer spreads and affects all areas, from the family to the government and the schools. And like a doctor, we too must properly diagnose the disease. Well, how do we diagnose the disease? What's the disease? If we think of it like physical cancer, the, the focus would be not on the world. The focus would be in the church. When I think of spiritual cancer, I'm thinking it, it's a something, it's abnormal cells that grow and damage cells that grow and spread inside the body. To me, spiritual cancer is not me looking to the culture. It's me looking inside the church. It's not looking to the culture it's looking inside the mirror and going, where are we messed up? Where is that, those abnormal damaged cells growing inside of me, hurting me spiritually? Where, where is the, the abnormal cells and damaged cells growing within the church? Where, where is the spiritual cancer within the church? Where is the spiritual cancer within the body of Christ? Not where is, where is it within the culture? The issue is inside the church. I think we, we spend so much time wanting the, the world to live like the church when the church doesn't even live like the church. So let, let's see what they say here. According to Barna, all right, now, now this, this is going, now, now, now they're going to put the attention. It's just when they, when they talk about family, government, and schools, that, that just, they're looking to the culture. But the next paragraph, they seem to bring it back to the church. According to Barna, nearly 72% of churches don't look to the Bible as their final source of authority and direction. Now, there's some spiritual cancer. If you got 72% of the church, if that, that statistic is accurate, 72% of churches do not look to the Bible as the final source of authority. That is a spiritual cancer. That is within the body of Christ, and you clearly have these cells, these damaged, abnormal cells growing and spreading. Now, that is something we have to look to in the church. We have to diagnose and purge it from the church. That's not the culture. They go on to say this. Um, they say, according to Barna, nearly 72% of churches don't look to the Bible as their final source of authority and direction. But this isn't surprising. The same was true in 700 BC. Like in Israel's day, we also have committed two evils. We have forsaken, and this is from Jeremiah 2.13, they have forsaken me and the fountains of living waters and hewn them cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. For true healing to take place, we must return to the fountain of living water and drink deeply. The Christian life is to be living and vibrant, not dry and dead. Cisterns hold water, the source of life. Broken cisterns represent pride and drain spiritual life from the soul. So if we, if we, if we go with this analogy, then we would say, here's the spiritual cancer, or, or this is what led to it, inside the church, inside your spiritual life and my spiritual life. We have forsaken God, turned our attention away from God, turned our back to God, and we've, listen, we've uh, from, and, and from we have forsaken God and the fountain of living waters, and we've hewn them cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they they've here's the here's the fountain of living water. 
Here's the found of the living God. Here's God. And, it's, and we've forsaken God. And we went and hewn out broken cisterns. We, 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 we tried to, in fact, let me, I'm going to look at this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I'm going to look up Jeremiah 2.13 in a number of translations. I want to see how this reads in a number of, of translations. Because I think, I think this goes the right direction here. All right. I'm going to read it from a, num- a number of, of, of translations. All right. Here we go. New International Version. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. New Living Translation. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. They have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. All right? So you get this idea that they they went and dug out, uh, and I think every translation uses the word cisterns. Let me look here. Um, every, uh, every single one, I believe, Okay, well, uh, as uh, another, another translation says it this way, because my people have done two evils. They have left the fountain of living waters and they went and they have dug pits for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Instead of looking to God, they looked to something else. They, they dug out looking for something else, something else for water, something else for, for satisfaction, something else. They turned their back on the living God. Now, Here's where I think this is important. This is where I think a spiritual cancer begins to form within the church. Listen to me carefully. The church looks into the world and we see everything that we don't like. We don't like this. We don't like this. We don't like that. We don't like that. And we see the world's a mess. And we may be, it may be true righteous indignation. It may be like our motives may absolutely be right and pure and godly that we don't like it we because we think it's an affront to God's holiness to God's glory and we may actually have righteous the right righteous feelings in regards to it it may not simply be i want the i want the country to be like it was when i was a kid it, it may be actually something spiritual involved here okay so let's just go with the idea that it's right motivation but in many cases the right motivation this is where everything becomes abnormal and damaged. We then almost forsake God. We don't look to God and go, what would God want us to do? What is, what is the biblical solution? We forsake God. We forsake the one that is the fountain of living water. We forsake that and we run out and we hew broken cisterns to try to fix the problem. We look for a different solution. And that solution tends to be politics, tends to be boycotts, whatever it may be, yelling and screaming about it on social media, whatever. And we, and we go look to something that, can't, that cannot hold any actual water. It's broken and it's going to lead you distracted, discouraged, dry, and it's going to lead to spiritual deadness and spiritual disease. I think that's what happens or has happened. We, we look to the wrong thing. We look to the wrong thing. And I think in many cases, we're looking to the wrong thing because we were really bothered, but we look to the wrong thing to fix it. So they say for true healing, healing to take place, we must return to the fountain of living water and drink deeply. The Christian life is to be living and vibrant, not dry and dead. Cisterns hold water, the source of life, but broken cisterns represent pride that drains spiritual life from the soul. Okay, I think broken cisterns re- represent that we are turning to that which cannot help, which will not work. And as Christians always seem to look to solutions to fix the moral degradation. We look for something other, and we almost want to force a morality upon unregenerate people, and it never has worked, never will work. You can look, you can give, you can give the country the best laws that have ever existed in the history of mankind. Those external laws will not change the depravity inside of man. Israel had the law. They had God's physical presence there his physical glory, I should say, there in the tabernacle. They had the right worship. They had the right priest. They had the right law. They had everything. And guess what? 
those, all of those external great, wonderful things did not change what was in their heart, and they rebelled, and they rebelled, and they rebelled, and they rebelled, and they rebelled. But for some reason, Christians always look to the world and go, the world's a mess. We need to fix it. And we almost want, we almost repeat the same scenario. Let's give them external rules, laws. Let's, let's pass law. Let's get some people in office, and we'll fix everything. You're not going to fix it that way. They're not going to, they're broken cisterns. What they need is the living water. What they need is salvation. They go on to say this, if we diagnose the disease of pride and return to him, his healing touch can revive, renew, and restore our barren wasteland. We must be desperate for more God, desperate for his presence in our churches again. It's truly our only hope. Now, yeah, I like the focus there. The focus has to be on the church. The key is, where did the church go wrong? Where, what led the church to broken cisterns? I think, what, I think the whole issue is that the church turns to other things and other solutions, sometimes for a spiritual problem. When the pew is sick, the pulpit must prescribe the remedy. But the remedy, the life-changing application of God's word, is being withheld. As a result, Jeremiah 531 is eerily similar to our condition today. The prophets prophesy falsely, and priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? Like the Isaiahs and Jeremiah's of Israel's day, pastors must diagnose spiritual cancer and provide treatment. A doctor would lose his license for saying that everything is fine when there are clear signs of cancer. How much more dangerous is it to remain silent in the midst of spiritual cancer? Instead of completely changing their spiritual diet, silent she shepherds continue to consume the junk food of liberalism and the downward pull of compromise. Now, let's stop right here. Once again, this is what drives me crazy. The, they constantly, the, the constant yell and scream is that it's the problem that's eating the church is it's liberalism, it's, it's, it's a woke ideology, it's critical race theory. It's always, we always look to these progressive liberal things as the thing destroying the church. Let me for the 19th billionth time say it again. Liberal churches who buy into quote unquote woke ideology, critical race theory, or whatever other progressive boogeyman that you're worried about, those churches that embrace those things had already abandoned the fountain of living water a long time ago theologically. The churches that embrace liberal ideology had already embraced liberal theology. They had already rejected the inspiration of Scripture. They had already called into question many doctrines and many the theologies. Therefore, they had turned their back on the fountain of living water a long time ago, and they embraced all of these quote-unquote liberal ideologies. So it's not the liberal ideologies are not the thing destroying the church. The destroying of the church was turning away from biblical theology. The problem was theological. So those churches on the, on the, on the more conservative side who may hold to good theology, we get so preoccupied about the liberalism, liberalism, liberalism. So here's what we do. The conservative churches abandon God and the fountain of living water, and we go shoot hew, out, we dig out cisterns that are broken because we then look to the solution is to fight the quote-unquote liberalism by embracing cons politically conservative, conservative ideology. We see the liberal ideology and think we have to fight it, so we turn to conservative politicians, we, we start talking like we're, you know, that we get our marching orders, not from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but from Glenn Beck, Mark Levin, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson. We embrace a conservative mindset to fight the liberal mindset. Well, then guess what you have? The liberal church has broken cisterns. The conservative church has broken cisterns. And then the people of God have nowhere to go because the church, both sides, are no longer giving you the living water. They're giving you the 
broken cisterns, the, the putrefied water that's in these broken cisterns that's leaking out because all it is is nothing more than political ideology. See, they immediately go to the liberal, the liberal, the liberal, the liberal. But everyone forgets that the, the conservative hijacking, the conservative, put it this way, the conservative ideology is just as much a spiritual cancer as the liberal ideology. It's not about liberal conservative. It should be about what's biblical, what is theological, what is Christian, which is drastically different than these other ideologies. So I agree. When the pew is sick, the pulpit must prescribe the remedy. But the remedy is the life-changing application of God's word. It is being withheld. As a result, Jeremiah 531 is similar to our condition today. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power. And people love to have it so. Yes, many people love to have it so because if they're pastor is giving them a little taste of their, oh, their, the political philosophy they so love, then they just eat it up and nobody realizes, wait a minute, this is a cancer. It's a cancer. This is not true spirituality. It's a damaged cell. It's an abnormal cell within the body, which is this political ideology that has has been embraced, which then spreads like a cancer. And the next thing you know, you have two Think of it this way, two bodies of Christ, one that's been infected with a liberalism, a progressive ideology, and one that's been embraced, that is being infected with a conservative ideology, where biblical theology and biblical doctrine and true desire for spirituality has been abandoned so that we can fight culture wars and fight political battles. All right, I, I cannot I cannot state this again. So and so they go on to say again, instead of completely changing their spiritual diet, silent shepherds continue to consume the junk food of liberalism and the downward pull of compromise. Instead of following Isaiah's lead of crying out and lifting their voice like a trumpet to warn the people of their sins, many follow the lead of false prophets who said, peace, peace, where there is no peace. We must pray diligently to ask for a mighty baptism of God's spirit upon our pulpits again. What will it take to break us? They go on to say this. Isaiah 66, 2 reminds us that God will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. As I recently wrote, when ministry becomes idolatry, God is not impressed by numbers, but by nearness to him. If the blind beggar is unworthy of our attention, we need to check our hearts. We are waiting on God, but could it be that God is waiting on us? Gun safes are full, but prayer closets are empty. Stock options soar, but hearts are not breaking. We are angry, but not desperate. We are mad, but not humble. We are enraged, but not broken. What will it take to break us? The red, red, white, and blue cannot save us, but the crimson blood of Christ can. Joel 2.13 tells us, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. To get the ear of God and experience spiritual healing, we must return to brokenness, reverence, and the fear of the Lord. Now, I completely agree with that. We must return to brokenness, reverence, and the fear of the Lord. But we, have, but we have to diagnose the problem is not just the liberal side. It's just not the progressive side. I, I constantly see videos or, or, or podcasts where, you know, you know we've got we to fight the critical race theory. We got to fight this. We, it's, it's, we got to f- fight progressive Christianity. And I'm like, have you looked at the conservative side? If the liberal side has been hijacked, the conservative side has been hijacked. What we need to do is stop fighting these, this political battle and realize that we need to get back to spiritual focus. That's what we have to get back to. They go on to say, when diagnosed with cancer, there is an urgency to make drastic lifestyle changes. When it comes to spiritual cancer, shouldn't we be just as aggressive and drastic? If not more so, shouldn't there be a sense of urgency? Absolutely. But we are not desperate enough Desperate people need to do desperate things and cry out like Isaiah. 
Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. When was the last time you spent half a day praying and fasting for God to rip the heavens open and come down? God listens to desperate, broken people who repent and focus on him. We must begin here. It's simple, but not easy. Through the scripture, the call of God is not to Washington, amen, Hollywood, or Sacramento, but to us. Now, I I, I completely agree, but I think, but I, I would just try to emphasize the cancer is inside the church. We have abnormal and damaged cells that begin to grow and spread within the body. And I think the way this develops is, and, and I'm again looking to the conservative side, right? Because the liberal side rejected biblical theology, right? So, so there, there was a theological compromise. Then they embraced all of this other liberal ideology because, well, they rejected the Bible. So they got to look to something else. They got to turn to something else because they basically rejected the inspiration of the scriptures. They denied all of that. So they looked to liberal ideology. Okay, so they're already compromised way before the, it's not about progressive, it's not about liberal, it's they rejected biblical theology. It was a theological compromise, right? And once you compromise the Bible or you throw it out, you've got to turn to something else. And they look to, they look to something else. They look to broken cisterns. They look to liberal ideology in order to address the, the ills of the world and the problems in the world, right? There's the compromise. Over here on the conservative side, well, they, we see the, the spread of liberal ideology. We can say, call it an ungodly ideology. We don't like it. We're bothered by it. We see culture changing. We don't like it. We want to fight the culture war. We want to fight the spread of, of evil ideology. And so what is the, ch- the conservative church did? They hewn out broken cisterns and look to pol- politics, look to boycotts and protesting and all of the other nonsense that many conservative churches find. And when I say protesting, in other words, we're going to boycott Disney. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's just all, it turned to everything other than what we're called to do, which first of all is look to our own spiritual condition, fall on our faces and repent of our own spiritual failings right? Do everything we can to be growing spiritually and then continue to do what the Bible calls us to do. No matter what's going on within the culture, whether it's good or whether it's bad, our focus is on the same, calling people to faith in Jesus Christ, right? To believe in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, baptize, bring it to the church, and then the last step, teach them to obey. The Great Commission has never changed. But on the conservative side, we've abandoned that, looking to fight culture wars through political means. So then the church prostitutes itself to politicians so that politicians can use the church to further their own political ideology and to gain political power. The church then just becomes used and discarded when they no longer need it. And then what we all we are ended up with is broken cisterns that cannot help, cannot heal, and cannot satisfy anyone's thirst. So then people look to the church and like too political, so sick of it, done with it, and then they leave the church. And then they're out there in a spiritual wasteland. That's that's where we are. That's how I'm going to diagnose the problem. I think for the conservative church. It's very similar to the liberal, the liberal church throughout the Bible, right? And therefore, they needed the liberal ideology in order to have something to hold on to. The conservative church saw all of the horrible things going on and said, we've got to fight it. And they, in a sense, threw out the Bible, right? Even though they would say that it's based off the Bible, but in a sense, they've set aside the Bible and biblical doctrine, biblical theology and biblical ideology, and they bought into a a political concept in order to fight it. And then we're running around, you know, yelling and screaming because someone at Target didn't say Merry Christmas or they won't call it a Christmas tree. They'll call it a holiday tree or we're upset about something Tucker Carlson told us to be mad about or we're yelling and screaming about critical race theory and, and losing our minds over that or, or whatever the case may be. Whatever, whatever the next big boogeyman that the political world tells us to be worried about, that's what we yell and scream about. 
That's what we get upset about, our, our marching orders, because we're, we're, we're looking to the broken cisterns. That's what we're looking to. We're not looking to the fountain. We're not looking to Christ. We're not looking to Scripture. We're looking to the conservative secular world to give us our marching orders, which is a cancer that the church has to wake up to. All right, I'm just going to stop there. That's at least, that at least gets us, well, I think an important concept. And I'm just going to set it here because I think this is very important because if you pay attention to what we're doing on Sunday mornings, we are studying, we started a series in the book of Jude. Now, if you have the Church One app, you can find all of the messages in the series so far. You just go to series and look for Jude and you'll see it. Um, and in fact, I, I created new artwork for it a couple of weeks ago. So you should be, have no problem finding it on the Church One app. Just download the Church One app, Church O-N-E, and then just... Uh, once, once you download the Church One app, just type in Theology Central, then it turns into our app, then go to Series, and then look for Jude. And I, we're, some of these concepts are going to show up there. That's one of the things I wanted to do this morning. When I saw this idea of spiritual cancer, it made me think of Jude. It made me think of Jude talking about, because when we, set up, when we started our intro to Jude, I talked about the faith, we have to define it, and then I talked about invasion and insurgency, that which comes from without right? And then that which starts fighting from within, and that the church has constantly have to be on the lookout for that which is trying to invade the church, and then we have to look for the insurgency that arises from within. Well, spiritual cancer arises from within us. Spiritual cancer is not that which comes from outside of us, it's inside of us, where we have abnormal or, or damaged cells that begin to spread and then tumors, and then they, they spread to all the different tissues throughout the body. That's, that's how it works. We got to look inside of us. The church is a mess. The culture is a mess. And I think because the culture is a mess, what's led to a bigger mess in the church is our attempt to try to fix the culture through a completely unscriptural way, which basically creates a cancer inside the church. All right, you can email me your thoughts, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I hope that went well. I apologize for a kind, of, kind of a rough start. I was... When, uh, when we, uh, just so that you know what happened, because sometimes it's interesting when you're sitting there trying to talk and you're doing your best to try to stay focused, but there's other things going on. When we got ready to go live, uh, the software that we use for Spreaker, it just, it took forever for it to go live. It just was spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. I, I may have taken almost a minute for it to finally go live. And the, I thought, I, well, I thought first what was going to happen is it was just going to crash and we weren't going to be able to go live. And then once we started to go live, I just, I was really, I, I was so preoccupied looking at the screen because I kept thinking at any minute, something's wrong. We're going to lose connection. And I, I was almost like, I was trying to talk, but I kept looking over there thinking, okay, don't, don't, don't commit too much to this because I think this is all going to stop. And you're going to have to start over, but it, it, it never stopped. So I'm sitting there looking at that, trying to talk to you about something as serious as cancer. And so then I'm sitting there trying to read the, uh, the whole discussion about cancer and I'm keep looking over at the, so I'm reading, looking at the screen, reading. You didn't see all of that, but yeah, there was, I was great, greatly distracted at the beginning. So I apologize if uh, that started off kind of rough. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be returning to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this article, and uh, I think it's going to come into play in our discussion in Jude. That's why I was telling you about the series in Jude. I think this is going to come into play there. So, all right, we'll stop right there. Hopefully, hopefully my approach, I know very different, but hopefully very beneficial. All right, everyone have a great day. God bless.